Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us, and we think you'll find today's lesson particularly interesting. This particular lesson is part of our series on the book of Luke. These are the Sabbath school lessons that's prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and we're, these are the, the series, this is the series for April, May, and June of 2015. This is number eight in that series from May 23 of 2015, entitled The Mission of Jesus. And one of the challenges that they're going to, they're going to present to us is, how would you describe the mission of Jesus? So I hope you have your Bible handy, that you're uh, ready, you're comfortable, and you're ready to think clearly. Um, we're going to dig into some real important stuff. But before we do that, let's pray together. Our wonderful Father, we consider it a great privilege to come apart at times like this to talk about your word and about your character, about all that you mean to us. And may we understand more clearly today as a result of our time together, your mission. We pray these things in the name of the one who came and showed us the way in Jesus himself. Amen. Amen. So, of course, the question would be, why did Jesus come to this world? And why did he have to die? That's a pretty loaded question, right? Could you sit down and maybe one paragraph write down why you think Jesus had to die? Well, our lesson says, suggests we should turn to Luke 19.10, entitled, and, and that says, The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, is that referring only to human beings? Only lost human beings. Only lost human beings? It could be the lost angels. Yeah. Apparently, they'd already committed themselves. Well, the statement is pretty clear. I don't, none of us would argue with that, would we? But it seems like it, it really only gives us part of the picture and part of the reason why Jesus came. While humanity was lost and totally subject to death, as you know, nevertheless, this tiny, sinful planet this little blue marble, and you know the pictures that we've seen sent back from the spacecraft, has become the lesson book of the universe. Um, we don't have time to read all these passages right now, but 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9 says we are the theater, the spectacle of the universe. Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, and 3, 7 to 10, and Colossians 1, 19 and 20 say that Jesus came not only for us on this world, but for the entire universe. And partly that will depend on which translation you're using. But he came for the whole universe. And he, not only that, he chose his church to say something to the universe. And that means us. We are supposed to be teaching the universe something. So by his life and his death, Jesus came to teach us a number of very important lessons. And I quote from Ellen White, Steps to Christ, page 20, paragraph 1. In the apostasy, man alienated himself from God. Earth was cut off from heaven. Across the gulf that lay between, there could be no communion. But the, through Christ, earth is again linked with heaven. With his own merits, Christ has bridged the gulf which sin had made so that the ministering angels can hold communion with man. And you remember in ancient times, there was Jacob fleeing from the wrath of his brother Esau, and he saw that ladder. And then when Jesus himself comes and he's choosing his disciples, his first ones who are trying to follow him, he talks about being some kind of ladder there, doesn't he? And I have a, a question that just popped into my mind. We, you mentioned that with this sin that humans were cut off from being able to communicate with God. Why is it that, that through sin we were cut off from communion with God, but there are certain passages in the Bible which seem to indicate that Satan was still able to go, you know, into the councils of heaven or, or do something Job up there. One and two. So why wasn't he, why, why wasn't he cut off? Uh, well, remember that he claimed to be the representative of this earth. And God says, okay, for right now, the majority of human beings on planet earth are sinners, so I can't, com I can't uh, dispute your claim to be, you know, the prince of this earth. And I think that's why he was allowed. Not because he was really wanted there, I'm sure. <laughs> so, you th so you think Satan is 
treated differently from all the other fallen angels. Is that right? Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. He uh, he has a special privilege because he is quote the representative of Earth. Right. But what what is it about our sin that cuts us off and his sin that doesn't cut him off? What I mean, it's also well, one of our understandings that you know we're sinful and we cannot we can't stand in the presence of holiness or we would die. Why didn't that seem to affect? Him. Yeah, it's too bad it didn't, huh? <laughs> <laughs> of course, if if that were the case, the great controversy would never have happened. This world would never have had a tree of knowledge of good and evil. There would have been no sin because as soon as Satan started to sin, he would have been destroyed. And God doesn't operate like that. He 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 lets sin play itself out so we can see. He wants us to see the dangers of sin, the the very evil of sin. And so we reject it because it's just evil. He doesn't want us to reject it just because he said, don't you touch that. He wants us to see it's evil. Well, Christ connects fallen man in his weakness and power, helplessness with the source of infinite power in that passage from Ellen White. But the salvation of man was only a part of Christ's reason for coming to this earth. Now we're going we're gonna to try to take a larger view. There was a larger, broader, deeper reason that Adventists have been helped to see through the insights given to us by Ellen White. Now, I want to make it very clear, if you read the passages I quoted a little while ago, and through other parts of the Bible, it's very clear that this message is in the Bible, but somehow or other, most of us, well, in the past, people didn't get it. And Ellen White, with her special insights, guided by the Holy Spirit, led us to these things, and now I'm going to mention some of those things. And don't you think we should take the largest possible view of things as we, as we look at them? Um, so I quote, and now this is uh, Ellen White, Signs of the Times, February 13, 1893. Uh, the only book it's found in is one called That I May Know Him, page 366, paragraph 4. Through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. That's a pretty clear statement, I would say. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ, the beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe. Notice he's manifesting it before who? Not just this earth, before the universe. And what's he manifesting? The goodness of the divine government. Beneficence is another word for goodness, right? The charge of Satan refuted. So Satan's lies are going to be refuted. The nature and result of sin made plain. So that's what we were talking about just a moment ago. We, God wants us to see the very evil of nature uh, of sin. Uh, and the perpetuity of the law fully demonstrated. We need to understand why God's laws are the way they are. And we need to understand as a principle why we need to follow them. Not just because God says so, but because they're the right thing to do. And I go on, and I quote another passage, again from Ellen White, and this one is found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68 and 69, a particularly potent passage. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the, the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. Now that's a huge issue. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be, be, world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. And I, it looks like she left out a word there. Doesn't the King James say all men? But men is in italics in the King but James. But men is in italics in the King James mean it was supplied by the translators. It's not there in the original. Not for emphasis. And that's John 12, 31 and 32. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men and women, of course, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. So there she says basically the same 
idea again. And one more, by coming, yes. I'm sure these quotations are in the Sabbath School lesson quarterly. No, they're not. How about in the teacher's edition no. of the lesson quarterly? No, I had it. Not these. there either, huh? No. You need to get them from Seahawks.org. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, our, our materials, as most of you know, I think, already, is our materials are available on our website at Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. They're available there if you want to look at them. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. Not alone for his earthborn children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look. And where does that come from? 1 Peter 1.12. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. How long is this desire of ages? Page 19, paragraph 2. How long are we going to be studying the plan of salvation that's carried out on this earth? Forever. Forever. Well, let's try one more. To the angels and the unfallen worlds, the cry, it is finished, had a deep significance. It was for them as well as for us that the great work of redemption had been accomplished. In other words, we have to have a larger picture of the plan of salvation, right? Not until the death of Christ was the character of Satan clearly revealed to the angels or to the unfallen worlds. The arch apostate, and who is that? Satan. Satan. Satan had so clothed himself with deception that even holy beings had not understood his principles. They had not clearly seen the nature of his rebellion. Desire of Ages 758, paragraph 3. So why did Jesus come to this earth and what was his main purpose? They seem to uh, state it pretty easily. Pretty clearly, huh? Uh, you, you started the lesson off asking um, in a few words, can you explain why Jesus had to die? And if we memorized any of these paragraphs, I think you'd be uh, on the good track. Right. But even before he died, when he was still in the Garden of Gethsemane, John 17, 1 to 4. Yeah. yeah. He, 17, 4. Even he says, before he got to the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah, he says, I've accomplished the work you gave me to do. Yeah. Uh, earlier in John 14, 9, he says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. John 15, John 16, yeah. and then John 17, I came that you can have joy now. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, what the, it was revealing the Father. I don't need to pray to the Father for you. It was a teacher, not a penalty payer. So if these angels didn't really understand all that was, uh, all that was involved here, how can they be held uh, uh, accountable? Well, we will be held, like the angels, we will be held accountable, not for what we couldn't know, but for what, how, what we, how we deal with what we do know. We are judged on the basis of what we know. I mean, what about the people in very remote areas in other parts of the world? God is going to judge them fairly, not on the basis of what I might happen to know as a theology professor of some sort, but on the basis of what they had a chance to know. God is going to be fair to everybody. So then the more you know, the harder your choices are? <laughs> the more you know, the better your choices are. The more willing you are to take instruction, to, to learn, that's really the minimum requirement to go to heaven. Yeah. Well, we need, to, we need to look at one other passage. Some of these have been fairly widely available. This one, which is probably the most impressive of all, is not widely available, and I quote it. The law of Jehovah was burdened. And this is talking about in the days of, of um, when Jesus was coming to this earth. And let me just see, yeah, yeah, i to make sure here I've got my quotations right. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions, and God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary. How would you like to worship a God like that? How would you like to live with him for the rest of eternity? Not much. Well, he, was, he is, he is uh, represented to this way today by people who, who say that they are servants of his. Yes. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. 
I know of people who believe that when the wicked finally perish outside the city there, God is going to be rejoicing. They're getting what they deserve. How about those that subscribe to theistic evolution? Yeah. I mean, you, with that uh, point of view, you have a uh, God that is for killing and death and suffering and all yeah. that sort of stuff. The very attributes that belong to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. What's he trying to do? He's trying to pull God down into his position so that he can push himself up into God's position. Jesus came to, Jesus, now here we're going to get a definite statement. Jesus came to teach men and women of the Father to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. Now how do you like that statement? Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. The only way. Now, this is a remarkable statement because she doesn't say, well, the most important way or one of the ways. She says the only way in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. So. What, why does he need to make God visible and familiar to our eyes? What comes through the eyes has a lot to do with what we learn. Yeah. I mean, it's a very, uh, it's one thing to read, but you don't retain a whole lot of it. You get the, the yeah. rays of light in there to go along with the sounds and the words. It's very impacting. And what we're, what we're seeing is God. Yeah. We're seeing how God would behave in our environment. Incredible. Well, Christ exalted the character of God, attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose. Now we had up there the only way. Now we have the whole purpose of his own mission on earth to set men right through the revelation of God. In other words, she's saying to get to know God is the key to salvation. But then again, if we realize that faith is a relationship with God as with a friend, of course, we need to get to know him if we're going to be his friend, right? So surely this quote is in the quarterly. No. It's Since not. it's talking about the it's whole mission, even, and that's what the title of the lesson is, yeah. the mission of Jesus. It's not even in the regular books that are produced by the White Estate or by the General Conference. Would it be fair to say that those who edited these lessons have a different set of theological spectacles? Well, I would say <laughs> that the, the man who wrote the lessons has done a remarkably good job, but yeah, I, think, I think he do. needs to go on. He may not recognize yeah. what he wrote. <laughs> That's also true. And we're not trying to be critical of anybody. We're trying to point out some things they probably haven't read. In Christ was arrayed before men the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name. Jim, you were talking about that a moment ago. I have manifested thy name. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And he has not yet been crucified. He has not yet been tried. He has not risen from the dead yet. When the object of his mission was attained, now we, we want to know what the mission of Jesus was, right? So what's his mission? The revelation of God to the world. The Son of God announced that his work was accomplished and that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. Now, three times in that passage, and now you'll notice that it's found in Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. That was her personal, she says, this is what I want to go in the church paper. A little bit later, it was, it was, it was printed in the Review and Herald. And then it was printed in Use Instructor. And then it was printed in Review and Herald again. So, uh, th those things are related. But... Um, long time ago, it's guardian of the yeah, day. Long time ago, 18, 1880s and 1890s. Why isn't it quoted? I think a reason why people may focus on the God so loved the world mm -hmm. and so on is because I think those kind of rhetoric tends to make people lean forward more than just telling people. Because most people who have not heard this, yeah. telling them that it's about God's character. Because mm -hmm. as human beings, we want to know it's all about us. Yeah. I got, I That's got a warm, fuzzy feeling to think about. <laughs> when you get to John uh, 16, 25, and 26, he says, 
I don't need to pray to the Father for you because the Father himself loves you. Oh, yeah. Of course. And that's, of course, that's following John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. Yes. So, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot, all about love. Then you get to John, uh, 1 John yeah. uh, 4, eight, 8 and 16, 16 yeah. God is love, mm -hmm. twice. So, so how important is it to be aware of, of this? Um, I, I guess in order to be saved, isn't it just good to have a, a, a more complete understanding? Do you have to have this understanding in order well, to be saved? I, I would say no. You don't have to have this understanding. Obviously, people are going to be saved with very primitive knowledge about God. But I'm saying, what a shame if we, living in this enlightened age with all this material available, I mean, it's on my computer here. It's, you can get it electronically. You can get it in a written form, you know, all that kind of stuff. For, to let this go to waste. Well, not only that, but it isn't as if it isn't in the scripture. You see, yeah. we, had, we had passages before. It's just, yeah. it's there, but overlooked, mm -hmm. not understood. Uh, and and if they've taken the time to to enlighten us through the scriptures, it it must have some significance. Yeah. And Paul said, yeah, I'm sorry. And Paul says in that context, it's time for us to grow up. The idea of it's all about me. That's that's. That's the child's approach. It's time for us to grow up. Well, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is primarily a book about God. It is to teach us about His loving character, about His law. It is to win us to love Him. And we've already mentioned a bunch of the verses that talk about that. In this lesson, we'll look at several parables, a miracle and a visit Jesus made, events as recorded in Luke 15 to 19, to see what we can learn about those things. So, the parables in this section of Luke are found almost exclusively in Luke. Why do you think that is? As they were told in the portion of his ministry when that only Luke covers, or predominantly only Luke yeah. covers. Yeah. Okay, so let's review that very quickly. Jesus spent the first year and a half mostly working under the radar. We know very little about that time in Judea. And then things got very difficult. John the Baptist was arrested. Jesus moved to Galilee. He spent the next year working in Galilee, and that's the part of, of his ministry that we know the most about. At the end of that year, they're ready to arrest him and kill him. They're searching for him everywhere, trying to catch him. And he takes his disciples, and he leaves, and he travels out to Caesarea Philippi and Tyre and Sidon, etc., and comes back on the other side of the Jordan and spends most of the rest of his ministry in either Samaria or Perea, which is the area on the other side of the Jordan, where there are a fair number of Jews, but also it was a Gentile area, primarily Gentile. And he repeats many of the lessons that he had given to the people in Galilee earlier. He repeats them now for, for this larger group. Um, so, and Luke, being the only non-Jewish gospel writer, talks a lot about that and most of the gospel most of the Jewish gospel writers skip that period completely they don't say anything about it at all um, so we have to turn to, to to Luke to talk about those final six months in his life and the key to that maybe we should look at this one passage Luke 951 as the time drew near when Jesus would be taken up to heaven he made up his mind to set out on his way to Jerusalem now, this doesn't mean he's immediately headed off for Jerusalem. It means he knows what things are progressing in that direction. He sent messengers ahead of him who went into the village in Samaria to get everything ready for him and so forth. And, and as we read through this section, you see that he's not in... He, he, he just briefly makes voyages over to, to Galilee and briefly makes voyages to Jerusalem. But primarily, he's in Perea and Samaria. Well... Look at um, Luke 15, 4 to 7 as a next passage. Suppose one of you has 100 sheep and loses one of them. What do you do? You leave the other 99 sheep in the pasture and go looking for the one that got lost until you find it. When you find it, you are so happy that you put it on your shoulders and carry it back home. Then you call your friends and neighbors together and say to them, I am so happy I found my lost sheep. Let us celebrate. In the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. Why do you suppose that is? Is that, is that reasonable? I mean, is God saying, I don't care about the good people? No. 
What's, what's going on here? The 99 didn't have to repent, didn't have to change their mind, but the one person did change his mind, change his thinking, his concepts, didn't he? Jesus tells this parable twice, once to a Galilean audience and then later to this Perean audience. Um, it tells us about the love of God and his incredible you know, desire to reach out to people who have who've turned away from him. Now, the sheep, did the sheep know it was lost? Yeah, <laughs> but it didn't know its way back home, right? I mean, we would say generally that's probably true. The sheep, sheep if, if they know which where the rest of the group is, they're going to try to stay by, aren't they, in general? So the, the sheep knew it was lost. So we're going we're gonna to compare it with the coins and so forth. Yes, Gordon? Footnote in, my, in the Good News says, respectable people, Jesus seems to refer here with irony to those who regard yeah. themselves as good yeah. mm -hmm. and therefore are n ha see no need of repenting. Yes. So that's what the respectable yes. people are. Yes. Those wonderful people called Pharisees and things like that. Is that us? You didn't have to ask that question. <laughs> just that side of the table. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was just that side. <laughs> well, Christianity is the only religion in which God seeks out his lost children. Is that important in your understanding of the plan of salvation? That's interesting compared to any other philosophy, religion. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Buddha doesn't go after his the Hindu gods. They aren't looking for followers. They're not out there trying to bring people back. Um, Some of them have a god that needs to be reminded that he's great. Yeah. <laughs> if a god needs to be reminded he's, he's great, he ain't great. <laughs> yeah. The soul that has given himself to Christ, I'm quoting again from Desire of Ages, page 483. The soul that has given himself to Christ is more precious in his sight than the whole world. The Savior would have passed through the agony of Calvary that one might be saved in his kingdom. He will never abandon one for whom he has died. Unless his followers choose to leave him, he will hold them fast. How's that for a promise? Hmm. Amazing, right? Yes. We should feel the responsibilities that rest upon us as Christians and labor as though we realize the value of souls. I mean, if you knew that your neighbors, Christ would, be, was, would have been willing to die just for one neighbor of yours, would you be more inclined to try to say something to them about the gospel? Well, we should feel the responsibilities that rest upon us as Christians and labor as though we realize the value of souls. Remembering that one soul saved in the kingdom of God is worth more than 10,000 worlds like this. How intense am I supposed to be about this? Um, How intense was Jesus about this? Well, I know, but... <laughs> but um, Isn't he supposed to be our example? Well, I don't see you running around doing everything that Jesus did. I didn't know anybody that did that. Yeah. Um, I spend am, my am I, I guess the next question, am I supposed to be like that? Am I supposed to be like Paul? Or, you know, not everybody can, yeah. can, do, can do all that. Somebody has to uh, cook. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody has to do something to, to put something in the offering plate. Yeah. Um, how... How intense is one supposed to, to to be about that? Well, I think I think God leaves that challenge for each one of us. He says to uh, He says to you, if you recognize the value of the people that you come in contact with every with every day, if you really recognize their value and how I feel about them, what would you do? You know, you've all know about the what, what would Jesus do kind of thing. That's kind of worn, you know worn itself out, but seriously, the question is, what would Jesus do? It gets back to the parable of the talents. We're supposed yeah. to use what we've got. And, maybe and we'll get more. Yeah, maybe develop some. So I guess part of the question might be is, and I know what the answer is going to be, but nevertheless. Ask the question anyway. <laughs> well, is my mission the same mission as Jesus? Well, partly. I mean, obviously, we, we're not divine. It's not our job to save the world, but it's our job to try to represent God the best we can in our part of the world. 
Okay. Now, we, th there's an important point here. We said that th we made several statements, very pointed statements in the early part of this lesson, that Jesus came to represent the Father, represent God, so we can understand what kind of person God is. Now, if you believe that Jesus came primarily to pay a penalty, you can't do that. So, you know, you can't really do what Jesus did. But if Jesus came to represent the Father and be the loving, kind person that Jesus was, we can come as close as possible to that. We, and we should. Again, let me read you this statement that a lot of people would disagree with. But this is Christ Optical Lessons, page 196. Remember that Christ risked all. For our redemption, heaven itself was imperiled. If Jesus had lost to Satan here on this earth, I believe the whole universe would have come unglued because God would have been shown to be a liar. He said, we can do this, we will do this, if Jesus had failed, I mean, the whole place would come unglued. At the foot of the cross, remembering that, our, that for one sinner Christ would have laid down his life, you may estimate the value of a soul. Well, by the lost sheep, Christ represents not only the individual sinner, but the one world that has apostatized and has been ruined by sin. So now she's talking not just about one of us in this world, but this world in the whole universe. Um, God gave himself in his son that he might have the joy of receiving back the sheep that was lost. Christ Topic of Lessons, page 190, paragraph 3. I don't know how those, those passages hit you, how they impact you, but it seems like someday we know that there's going to be a group of people who really do this. I don't think it's going to be a huge group of people, but there's going to be a group of people who really do this, and say it's going to make Satan so angry, he's going to do everything possible to destroy them. And he's going to fail. And they're going to look up and see Jesus coming in the clouds. So to bring that to today, I can, especially where we live in America, I can go out and get a job, work for many years, and live to kind of a ripe old age and have a good life. But if I'm doing, representing God correctly, I mean, Jesus had a very short time on the earth. Is that going to affect my lifestyle? I think it will. Priorities. I, I, hmm? One's priorities affect yeah. how you mm -hmm. live. Well, we, we've got other things to talk about to compare. What about the coin that was lost? Did, did, did the coin know it was lost? I have no clue. Coin doesn't know anything. Now this coin wasn't just a five cents or ten cents or a penny or something like this. This coin was equivalent to a working man's daily wage. So it was a significant amount of money. So this is the, this is the story about the lady who lost her coin. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And it talks about she had ten, she lost one. Ten of those coins would be a significant amount of money. And sometimes they would, women would, would actually uh, weave cloth in a way so that they could they could hold these coins in in the cloth and they would wear it as a decoration uh, to to demonstrate the family's wealth. Kind of like a necklace, diamond necklace. Yeah, a little bit, but they were usually wearing more likely across their head, top of their head. Um, kind of like a tiara. Maybe. It could be what would? Out of a dowry too, couldn't it? Yeah, probably was. Yeah. Is there a sense in which we are supposed to, now, now these coins, I've been, I actually got a book, I ran into a gentleman uh, at some meetings, some religious meetings recently, who had actually put together a thick book about how ancient history impacts, or, or how, well, uh, not only ancient history impacts it, but how Christianity has impacted, impacted ancient history as represented in coinage, the way people made coins. And one of the first things we know is that one of the very first things that was happening uh, was that they would take a small piece of gold that was fairly malleable and they would put a special stamp on it and that, that special stamp had 
a picture of, of a Roman leader of some kind. Maybe it was a local leader or maybe even the emperor. And then one giant whack and the gold was soft enough so he would have the impression of, of, um, of, of, a, of a leader. And our lesson suggests that maybe what is being suggested here is that we are supposed to have the impression, bear the mark or the impression of God. We're not the result of random events following a massive explosion somewhere in the universe. Have you ever heard that story before? We bear the divine imprint in our very existence. Well, of course, the big story, the most common, the most popular story, the one that's talked about and preached about all the time in that, in that chapter of Luke 15 was the story of the prodigal son. Luke 15, 11 to 32. Um, maybe we'll take a moment to read part of it real quickly. Uh, I think most of you know the story very well. Jesus went on to say, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of the property now. So the man divided his property between his two sons. After a few days, the younger son sold his part of the property and left home with the money. I mean, imagine this. Here's a man, a fairly wealthy man, presumably, with a large bit of property. He says, you know, and the older son got how much? Two-thirds. The firstborn son would get two-thirds, and the younger son would get one-third. And he sells off, I mean, imagine him selling a third of his, I mean, what do the neighbors think? He's selling off a third of his property, his dad's property, grabs the money in a, probably in a big gold bag and heads for off for the wild country. He went to a country far away where he wasted his money in reckless living. He spent everything he had. Then a severe famine spread over that country and he was left without a thing. So he went to work for one of his, the citizens of that country who sent him out to his farm to take care of the pigs. Try to imagine a Jewish man, young man, who's proud of his Jewish heritage, taking care of pigs. He wished he could fill himself with the bean pods, not the beans, the bean pods the pigs ate. But no one gave him anything to eat. At last he came to his senses and said, all my father's hired workers have more than, I, more than they can eat. And here I am about to starve. I will get up and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer worthy, fit to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers. So he got up and started back to his father. And then the most amazing part of the story, what comes next? He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His heart was filled with pity and he ran through his arms around his son and kissed him. Father, the son said, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. But the father called his servants, and I would like to suggest the father probably didn't hear any of that speech. He called the servants, hurry, he said, bring the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger. And that ring was for what purpose? To sign the bank account, right? To sign up for the bank, to sign checks for the bank account. And shoes on his feet. Then go and get the prize calf and kill it and let us celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he's been found. And so the feasting began. And then, of course, there's the story of the older brother who wasn't happy about it at all. Well, uh, our lesson divides this. Well, um, our lesson divides this story up into uh, a group of seven sections. First section is give me. Give me what? My inheritance. Give me my inheritance. So, what does? What does this say about the son's thinking about the father? What does he think about his father at this point in time? He's too rigid, too hard, too confining. I mean, you know, this living at home and working hard in the, garden, in the fields every day, forget that, I'm headed off for unhindered freedom, right? Yeah, all you have to do is read what goes on in some of the wild parties and spring break and things like that, and you realize what that unhindered freedom is like. Nothing much has changed. <laughs> and then the question is, why me? Well, the Greek word for riotous, a soros, appears three other times as a noun in the New Testament for drunkenness, rebelliousness, 
and debauchery that includes lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. But it was not long before he found himself caring for pigs. Do you think before he got to that point he noticed that his uh, wealth was diminishing? I mean, you know, you would have thought that at some point he would have said, you know, things are getting a little thin here, right? Probably drunk a lot of the time. Yeah. And then the next statement is, make me. What is he talking about? He came to his senses. What does that mean? So, and he, so what a fool he'd been. Yeah. And in contrast to the story about the lost sheep and the coin, he knew how to get home, didn't he? <coughs> he knew how to get home. He began to realize what a blessing home was. Was his attitude toward the father changing? <clears throat> he was prepared to accept any position his father offered him. What attractions allure us in the world today? Are we allowing them to consume our time and efforts instead of focusing on our loving Heavenly Father who calls us to come home? How many of us are trying to get as much of this world's pleasures in as we can without sacrificing heaven. Well, the next question I would ask you is, try to imagine yourself in that young man's position. He's got a ways to travel. He, he has little or nothing. He probably had a little bit of money to buy some food on the way home, but he's starving. And he's walking and walking and walking and walking. What's he thinking about as he's headed for home? He'll be working on his speech. Working on his speech, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. And he's probably trying to think of everything he can remember about his father. He probably had some good memories about how his father treated his employees. Yeah. And then and, and after seeing life on the other side of the tracks, uh, maybe his father was a really pretty decent guy. Yeah. Do you think he thought about the goodbyes when he left? Right, yeah. One thing I find interesting about that story, though, there's nothing that the son was asked to do <coughs> except come home. Uh, and most people can't not, they, they say, no, nah, that, that's a different situation. You've got to jump through these hoops or somebody's got to pay a penalty for you because justice demands. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. Well, he finally reached the place where he recognized the father as my father. I've sinned against... My father, I've sinned against God, right? He had to be willing to confess his mistake and his sins against the Father and against God. And three, he had to go on to say that he was not claiming once again his position as son because he was no longer worthy. He was merely throwing himself on the Father's mercy, right? Finally, he planned to plead, just make me one of your hired servants. Then finally, but the younger son had completely misunderstood his father's love. Luke 15, 20 and 20, if you want to read it again. The father had kept a constant vigil. I mean, how was it that the father recognized him when he was way down the road there? Waiting for him. He, was, he has been waiting, watching down that road many times, probably every hour. And what, 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 did he expect, what do you suppose he expected to find as he... Look down that road? Not, not his father looking for him. I, I, well, I, I was thinking more about what do you think the father expected to find? Oh, I see, yeah. I don't think he cared as long as it was him. Yeah. I think the father knew that when he came back, things were probably pretty bad. But he didn't want people to see what kind of a mess his son had gotten himself into, right? He said, cover him up with the robe, Give him the ring, put some shoes on him, welcome him home as if he were a success. What does that say to us about God? Well, it's a, a lesson in justification. Yes. Okay. Reading, I'm, I'm reading the passage, I just have to read it one more time. He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His heart was 
filled with pity, and he ran, threw his arms around his son, and kissed him. He didn't say, oh, you dirty scoundrel, clean yourself up, did he? The moment had come for the son's prepared speech, but apparently the father didn't hear a single word. It's hard to imagine a better picture of God than that. So maybe this parable should be called the forgiving father instead of the prodigal son or the two sons, either one. We don't know how long it took for that for the son to waste, waste all his money and finally realize he needed to come home. But when the father accepted him back, he didn't impose any, Jim, as you suggested, any conditions on the prodigal son before he accepted him back. And the feasting which took place was for whose benefit? It wasn't the son who said, you know, I, I expect a feast when I come home. No, the father said, even to the older brother, what did he say? We are feasting because I am so happy. Which matches what we read up above. There's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over 99 just people. So here we have it in a different context, but the same story, right? What do you think the servants had to say? They had some food for thought, that's for sure. Yeah. It was as if the son had died and now he's come back to life again. And the entire home was full of rejoicing. But the elder son, and now we, we get the other side of the picture, who do you suppose he's talking about here? dutifully carrying out his duties in the field, returned home with a very different attitude. Let's just look at that for a moment. Uh, Luke 15, uh, 25 to 32. There's another Martha. Mm, like sort of. <laughs> in the meantime, the elder son was out in the field on his way back. When he came close to the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother, your brother has come home, the servant answered. And your father has killed the prized calf because he got him back safe and sound. The elder brother was so angry that he would not go into the house. So his father came out and begged him to come in. What, 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 what kind of people are angry because of God's love? <clears throat> Those who are trying to earn their way to heaven. What, what's the purpose of that part of the story? I mean, we were fine until, <laughs> until we got this part of the story showed up, you know. It kind of fits kind of what <laughs> the gospel is, and it's almost now got, this guy shows up. It's almost got a taste of what the devil did to God. <clears throat> yeah. Here I've been your head angel, and you won't get me further up the ladder. Why should I do it anymore? You know... Uh, we usually, when we hear sermons on this story, it's really um, a message about how God relates to, to us as individuals. That's usually it. Are there overtones here in this story about, about <clears throat> the Jews and the Gentiles here? Yes. Could the prodigal son be kind of a Gentile? And the, 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 the complaining son here, the jealous son, uh, uh, the Jews in Jesus' day being upset that um, here these other people are being accepted into the privileged arena. Yeah. And the older son says, what? Look all these years. Now, who among the Jews can you think about in Jesus' day? would give a speech like this. <clears throat> Look, all these years I have worked for you like a slave, and I have never disobeyed your orders. I mean, all these things I have done since my youth up, does that sound familiar? Yeah. Same thing. What have you given me? Who's he thinking about? How to be loving and kind? No, he's thinking about how to be as selfish as possible. Not even a goat for me to have a feast with my friends. Now, do you think the father would have given him a goat if he'd asked for it? Of course. 
but this son of yours wasted all your property on prostitutes, and when he comes back home, you kill the price calf for him. My son, the father answered, you are always here with me, and everything I have is yours, but we had to, we had to celebrate and be happy because your brother was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. And how did the older brother respond to that kind of a, an appeal? Kind of soaked, stomped off. We're not told. Yeah. And why are we not told? Any idea? I think it's because the story's not over yet. Jesus is talking to the older brothers. He says, "Do you get the picture? <coughs> what are you going to do?" The Jews in yeah. the audience, the Pharisees, etc., in the audience. And the Seventh Day Adventists today. Oh, there goes that side of the table again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we find when he found out why they were was rejoicing, he was angry, complaining, and self-righteous, and he refused to recognize his brother. He was very unhappy and unwilling to recognize why the father was so happy that this prodigal son, who had been effectively dead, was alive again and had come home. Was he worried that he might have to share some of his inheritance again? It's possible. <laughs> well, try to put yourself in the older brother's shoes. How would you feel? Maybe we better not ask anyone to answer that. Mm -hmm. He had stayed home, worked hard, felt like he was living a monotonous life. He was very upset that the father was spending some of his hands on Why wasn't he as enthused to see his brother as the father was? I'm sure the father talked a lot mm -hmm. about the day he made his son's going to come back. To, or that he wanted to do some of those things himself, but he yeah. was the good older son that needed to yeah. do everything right. Well... Some people would have said, did God really risk everything to come and seek and save those who have been willing to law, those who are willing to respond? He never uses force. The exercise of force is contrary. I'm reading now, again, from Desire of Ages. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. So who in this story is awakening love? To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. There's that controversy thing again. This work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings, Malachi 4.1. That's Desire of Ages, page 22, paragraph 1. Well, we're going to spend some more time on this later, but the next parable is, of course, this parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, we don't have time to go through it in detail now. Um, there's a lot of people who take that story to mean, well, you know, when, when we die, where are we going to go? Into the bosom of Abraham. So paradise is man's hairy chest. I guess so. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous because they don't. Th that isn't the punchline of the story. No, <laughs> the punchline of the story is follows that. And many Christians take the story to mean that after you die, if things don't work out, if have if they haven't worked out in this life, you'll have another chance. What is what does the Bible tell us? There are really only two things that this this parable really teaches. Now is the time to respond to God's call because there won't be another opportunity after death. It is not a parable about the sin of riches or the righteousness of poverty. Two, since there will be no second chance, we need to recognize we have no time to, to delay. Unfortunately, many look at this parable and think that even if they do not change their behavior and their thinking now, they will have another opportunity. Not true. But if Christ's whole mission was for the purpose of teaching us the truth about God, how could we take that for granted and pretend like it doesn't really matter? Often God's love for sinners is pe preached and in the context especially of his forgiveness. But God's love is not intended to be an ex excuse for us to keep on sinning so God can forgive us more. <clears throat> Why was this parable thrown into a lesson on 
the mission of Jesus? Uh, maybe because it comes next in the story. Well, it doesn't come, well, it's the next chapter, I guess. Yeah, good question. Well, there's no way this could be a true representation of God who is omnipresent and omnipotent. Because he says, you know, I'm sorry, but I, I can't get across this gulf. Huh? God can't cross the gulf? I mean, that's ridiculous. It's interesting to observe that when the real Lazarus was raised from the dead in John 11, all they could think about was how to get rid of him as well as how to get rid of Jesus. And Even someone, yeah. And Jesus says they've got Moses and the prophets means yeah. at that time was the Old Testament. Right. He says if you're unwilling to study that, even if somebody comes from the dead, it'll have no impact on you. And that, what do they celebrate now? They celebrate Easter, the resurrection. Yeah. That, 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 that isn't a lesson. The, 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 the real lesson is how Jesus died and, and what the meaning of that death was. And yeah. it wasn't in the nature of a payment of penalty. It's a demonstration of what the love that God will manifest. There's two more stories here that we won't have time really to focus on. The healing of Bar blind Bartimaeus. Jesus is walking along the road and the man cries out because he hears a crowd. And Jesus heals him on the spot. And then there's a, that famous story about Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus. Uh, what happened with him? He's the tax, the chief tax collector of Jericho. Probably one of the richest men in town. And it, if we take the story of Ellen White as she presents it, he'd already learned about Jesus and he started to think, you know, I want to I fix things. I, I want to work my way back. But then he heard that Jesus was coming to town. He had to see him. But he was a short guy. And all these other people were crowding in and just could not see Jesus. And so what does he do? He runs around, takes a side street, gets up ahead of the crowd, climbs up in a tree, and there comes Jesus. And he said, Zacchaeus, guess what? I'm coming to your house tonight. And I, <laughs> you know, Zacchaeus was, a pro Zacchaeus was probably ready to fall out of the tree. <laughs> he was so surprised. And what does that tell us again about the love of God? It stands to everybody if you'll take it. What would happen if Jesus invited himself to your house unexpectedly? Have you thought about that? Would you want to be there a little while ahead to clean things up a little? Would you need to take some things out of the refrigerator and change the reading material a little bit? That's your question. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we bow once again, recognizing the truths that have been presented to us in this lesson, we thank you so much for it. May we represent these things in our own lives as far as possible is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.